The following program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters. Hello and welcome to the Happiness Jungle TV show. I am your guest host, CammieBaker.com, and I am excited as I always am to do the shows because we have such yummy, yummy guests. And today, my friend that's on is someone that I met, oh gosh, four or five years ago. I was doing a networking event and I noticed that he was a networking expert and I invited him to my event and here we are four years later. Robbie Samuels, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, as you mentioned, uh, I have been sort of creating, welcoming, and engaging experiences for my whole life. Didn't know it was a, a career or a business path until probably the last few years, but I've always loved convening people. I think that's where it all starts. I think that's interesting, the way you put just curating relationships. Sure, yeah. I mean, I was the kid who would match together all the different social circles that I was in and, and invite them to be in one space. I was also the kid who understood what it felt like to not necessarily know if I fit in mm. and that sort of feeling of do I belong uh, you know are these spaces open to me like literally I remember campers with a, standing in a circle probably they didn't even notice me but they didn't make space for me to join that circle and it really influences the way I think about creating not just a space but a space where people can show up and bring more of their full selves so that's been no matter what I do whether it's speaking coaching hosting events it's been a through line to make sure that people actually aren't just invited, but feel welcomed. So that must be exactly where your book came from, <laughs> Bagels. Croissants versus Bagels, yeah. yeah. Strategic, effective, and inclusive networking at conferences. So the bagels are those tight networking circles, those shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder huddles that are impossible to break into, much like those campers, right? Right. And then the croissant is when someone on the inside of that circle opens up their body language and makes space for others to join. That's the croissant. Nice, nice. Now, I'm not sure where I first saw you online, but there was something that said you were a networking expert, so I invited you to my meeting. Mm -hmm. You know, so often people think, oh, I'm a realtor and they're a realtor. We're in competition, or I do SEO and they do SEO. We're competing. But I've always found it very interesting to bring people in who do something similar because mm -hmm. there's always room to, to learn and expand. And, and frankly, what we do is similar but very different, and now, yeah. Three, four years later, we both have gone in a little bit different niche. You're working with people to help them get their books off the ground, aren't you? Well, uh, actually, that's a piece of it. Uh, often, the clients that I work with one-on-one, because -on -one, that's sort of my speaking engagements and then my one-on-one -on -one coaching slash group coaching, the clients that I work with, the individuals, they come to me wanting to either launch a book or launch a podcast. It's a shiny object. And it may or may not be the best next thing for their business, but what it really indicates for them well, to me and eventually to them, is that they want more, that they want to have uh, diversified revenue streams. I have a client who has been a coach, a career coach for 18 years. She doesn't have an email list. She doesn't have a landing page. She doesn't have, um, she has a full calendar, full huh. calendar, but she doesn't have any offering beyond that one-on-one -on -one coaching, which means that every hour she works is the only hour she gets paid. Mm. She's in her late 50s, she wants to think about how to do something different, a podcast caught her attention, but now as we work together, both one-on-one -on -one and she's also my group program, um, is to think about how that's related to our business. So now she's creating the landing pages and sending off her, since her first email out today, you know, <laughs> like, and, and she's got her landing page so that when she launches her podcast next week, it's, it's all well-rounded and within a year she'll have a minimally viable product, some sort of group offer. So I work with women who tend to be uh, sort of later in their career, late 40s into their 50s and 60s, that they want more, but they don't have a ton of time. That's, there's usually a, a compelling energy to get it done now. Um, they're not gonna like DIY it. They're willing to invest in themselves. And mm. the transformations are real. And I, I love that part of my work. Nice, you mentioned uh, email list. I have to ask, are you doing anything with the bots yet? No, I've not engaged the bots. 
I haven't engaged I the haven't bots. I haven't engaged the bots. I've started playing with them, but they, they say that emails, 10 to 12% get open, and with the bots, it's an 85% open rate because it's more of a message than mm -hmm. an email. Mm -hmm. So. I've, I, I have to say that I, uh, the mistake that I think a lot of people make early on in their career is not A, getting an email list to put together, and B, figuring out what to send. And I actually have been, so maybe about the last six months, maybe a little longer, maybe almost a year now, I send a little story with a challenge for this week, and then I include the links to my current podcast and one from the archives, and a, you know, and a call to action in the, in the PS. And my stories are just cute little vignettes that are compelling, and they have some sort of message, and, and they're on brand for me. I'm getting positive feedback, and my open rates have actually increased tremendously. Because, it, like you said, it's conversation based, yeah. and that's why people know if they click on it, they're going to get a little story, they're going to get a little takeaway, and by the way, a reminder that there's a, a podcast to listen to. I am guilty, guilty of having a horrible email list and not keeping <laughs> up with it, not knowing what to do with it, not knowing what to send yeah. to it, and getting frustrated with it, and literally throwing the email list away and mm. starting over. Just, wow. Just crazy. Yeah. It's since I, so I was in real estate for 15 years on and off and in network marketing for five years on and off mixed in there and then stepping into the Mingle to Millions brand. Mm -hmm. um, it's just been, uh, it, it, since I've created Mingle to Millions, I've been kind of basically your client who yeah. is um, uh, ignorance on fire is what I call it. <laughs> so there's knowledge on ice, people who are really smart but they're doing so much analysis paralysis that they can't move. They're on yeah. ice. They're knowledge. They're smart, but they don't know what to do, and they're not going to do anything. But then there's those of us who are just ignorance on fire. Trying you know? everything. And just trying everything. Trying what sticks. And I think there's a point at which that's, that is helpful, and, it, and you learn a lot. But I learned that there's a difference between <clears throat> just-in-case learning and just-in-time learning. And I spent a, the good few, my first few months of, I'd left my career and I said, okay, this is gonna be a job, I'm gonna do this. And I was listening to podcasts and I was signing up for courses and it was just, a, it was just an overload of information. Mm -hmm. And I finally had this sort of, oh, revelation. So that advice <clears throat> came through uh, Smart Passive Income's Pat Flynn. And he heard it from Jason Van Orden, who uh, was the host of Internet Business Mastery. And you know, just this idea of now, on the way here, I was listening to podcasts about how to design the perfect about page because I'm ready to update mine. It's desperately needed to be updated. So you were talking about your email list. So I, as I work with my clients, I realize I have to up my game, mm -hmm. right? So I'm giving them all the basics. Well, then I have to get to the next level, the next level, because I want to lead them down a path. I learn. I'm very transparent as I learn. I share what I learn. So I just consumed like five or six little you know, short podcasts thinking, OK, what can I take away? And, and then this is, this is a just-in-time version of learning, right? So that's, that's kind of where I'm at with my show. Well, and I love that one of the things that really resonates with, for me about you, is that you're practicing what you preach. Mm -hmm. I say all the time, don't hire a financial advisor that's <laughs> broke as a joke. Don't hire someone in, for physical training that's out of shape. Mm -hmm. And don't hire somebody to teach you something that they're not doing, have never done, and won't do. You know, so you're right in there. So the same for me. The more I know, the more I know I don't know, yes. and the more I know I need to know. And the more clients I take on, the more coaching I need. I just hired another coach last year. Do you know Laura Langmire? No, I don't. Yeah, I just uh, took on a really intense coach. So, nice. so I tend to scare my people. I don't mean to, but they're like, you know, you make me just a little bit nervous, Cami. I feel like you're, and they like that though. P the people that hire me want to want to be held accountable. Yep. They know that they need somebody, especially as entrepreneurs and speakers and authors. We tend to. The great thing is we have our own schedule, but the bad thing is we have our own schedule, <laughs> right? So they like being held accountable, and I've hired somebody that scares the bejesus out of me too, and will help hold me accountable. Well, I am starting in January with Dory Clark, who I have uh, known and been friends with, and she's been a mentor of mine for 10 years. Mm. And she's an international best-selling author, speaker, you know, has, has all the accolades, uh, incredibly rec well recognized as an expert in her field. And uh, I just, I know I need that kind of direct support. And I agree, don't hire a coach if they don't have a coach. And mm -hmm. you know, that's just a super important way to start. I think the other part of my work is about, uh, is going back to sort of convening. My background is organizing fundraising events, and so and I ran conferences, and I have that sort of history. So I work with associations around how to design more engaging conference experiences for all attendees, for all participants, but particularly those who are attending for the first time and those attending solo. 
and the solo folks tend to be a little overlooked. But it's, it's hard, even if it's a fun, I had a client, the National After School Association, they're a fun bunch, they know how to do a good theme, every day of the conference is a theme day, mm. but what if you arrive and you didn't know to bring a jersey from a, your favorite football team? Right. And so everyone else is running around with their football jerseys, with pom-poms and all that, and you're like, you're like uh, just standing here. So there's about sort of how do you have that vibrant space, but inclusive vibrant space? How do you welcome people in? And I do a combination of pre-event webinars, the first timers orientation, you know, breakouts, keynotes, train people on their welcome remarks. So it, so it ends up being a little bit consulting as well as sort of being there to really shepherd people through an experience as, because we all go to conferences, this is why my book was focused on this, but we don't go with a purpose. You could stay home and get content. I mean, you yeah. don't need to leave the house to get good content anymore. We go for the experience. You go for the experience, you go for the people. That's fascinating. How do you go about getting in touch with those groups and, and being able to present your value and have them see the value of bringing you in to do that? Well, so many associations are actually identifying that they need to be providing more in that experience, right? It's not just the content. Um, generationally, what people expect. Millennials are actually really eager for this kind of connection because they haven't always had it and now they're seeking it. Mm -hmm. uh, people our age are, are like, yes, you know, this, if I'm going to travel all the way over there and spend thousands of dollars or even if it's not my money, it's still my time, I want to make sure it's worth it. So I think a little bit of the onus is on, on the people attending to go in with a purpose and that's why I get to work with those clients, whether it's sales teams that are heading to a conference, I might work with them. Um, if it's the actual you know, regional conference or a national conference, working with them on, well, what is the ROI for them? It's retention. Mm. Uh, the drop off in the first two years of membership is, is staggering, it could be 50%. So you do a lot to recruit people and then 50% of them leave within two years because they show up the first year and they're like, I don't know, this is my space. The second year, they didn't get a warmer welcome. <laughs> if, if they stick around year three, year four, by year five, it's a, it's a reunion. They right. plan their entire schedule around going to that conference. They will never miss it. Those first couple of years, so part of that pitch is me, helping them meet their own internal goals. And what I do for my speaking for, for in the last decade is I'm training regular attendees, people who just go every year or every month. If it's, you know, if it's a local group, but they've gone three times quickly. Mm. I train them to be hosts, to have a host mindset, to think about how to engage people and bring them in. Because, you know, if you're brand new and you walk over and talk to a wallflower, they seem like an easy person to approach, but that's the most awkward ending ever. <laughs> they don't know anyone, you don't know anyone, you're like, hey, I'm gonna, it was nice talking to you, I'm gonna go use the restroom. They're like, oh, well, nice talking to you, oh, I'll join you. That sounds like <laughs> that's a good idea. So I just think, you know, kind of empowering the people who go regularly and helping them understand that for their organization, their association to be sustainable uh, and vibrant and growing, we need to retain these members, that the newest people are actually the really important part of the organization. And here's the role you play. Here are the questions you can ask when you meet people. Here's the way you can bring people in to a space. And so that's sort of the, it's a little bit on the side of the organizers and a lot also on those of us who are going to these events. Well, so you're helping them to create community. Mm -hmm. And like I said before we started shooting, there's something that we need to be doing together because the space that we live in is so similar yet very different nuances. So for example, what I like to do for conferences and associations and trade shows is actually talk with the vendors. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a hundred vendors there and they're all so focused on getting the customer to come up to their table, they want the customer to come up to the table, but they're not working with each other. So, for example, if it's a health and wellness and you got your chiropractor and you got your Reiki person and you got your person selling the oils and the lotions, and you all have the same clients. Each one of you have people that are into health and nutrition and living a healthier right. life, et cetera. So if there's 100 of you there, regardless of who else walks in the door, network with each other. Absolutely. And I don't know about you, but I always feel like when I go, when you can feel the, the competitive energy. So you have a real estate agent and a painter standing side by side. They don't, they're not in competition. They're totally different businesses. But because they're in this environment, it's like, I want to get more people to my table. It makes my ego look good. I want to get more people here than that guy. So there's even a little bit of a competitive yeah. nature just in the fact that they're side by side at this event. So one of the things I help people is, with is, 
pre-event event. Mm -hmm. Let's come on 30 days beforehand. Let's talk about how, while you're there, how you can network with each other, getting there early, you mm -hmm. know, and helping other people set up, you know, and, and, and getting to know some of the other vendors so you can say, hey, you should go see Robbie. He's got a really phenomenal book over there. Mm -hmm. Or go talk to Mary. She does a quick back massage, mm -hmm. right? So there's so much. Right, and there's always downtime. Like, that's the silly part, is that there's always times when participants are in session, mm -hmm. and so everyone's just standing there on their phones, and it's such a missed opportunity. Any mm -hmm. trade show, any time there's an exhibitor space at a conference. You know, I, when I was younger and I was, I was attending these things, and I had my pitch, I never got a table. I counter-flyered, and I would train interns on how to do this. You go up to a table, even a career fair. You go to a table, you let the person say their piece. You acknowledge it. You, you know, you, you respond to it, and then you sort of say, and I would actually have a flyer on the back of a clipboard, and at some point, I'd kind of flip the clipboard up, and they would kind of look down at it, and they'd, and I'd go, oh, this? <laughs> and then I'd engage, and then I'd get them to sign in, and I'd, get, and I'd walk away with their email address, and I'd be able to follow up and reach out to them about scheduling a, a chat when they have more time. I know you're kind of busy right now, but when you have more time, we should chat. And you know, counter flyering is because they're they're there. They have to say their piece, but you can also engage with them. You know, rather than trying to go wander around and track people to your booth, go where people already are. It's it's like the basics of good organizing. Right. Go where people already are, as opposed to trying to attract people if, if, to a place that they haven't been to before. So how did you decide to write the book, start becoming a speaker on this? I mean, you were a, naturally a connector, yeah. but were, were you ever in corporate? Did you have a regular J-O-B, or have you <laughs> always been an entrepreneur? So uh, not corporate, but I was in nonprofit. So my background is nonprofit. I spent about 15 years doing a variety of roles. The last 10, I was at the same organization, organizing 25 fundraising events a year, raising mm. about a million dollars a year through fundraising events. Uh, and I had uh, a portfolio of major donors. Um, and I, kinda, I grew. I grew and I grew up in that role. It was basically there through my 30s. Mm. <laughs> so I grew and I grew up a lot in that role. But, but this actually, in some ways, stems from, uh, I started a, a meetup group, meetup.com, called Socializing for Justice, a year after I joined that particular nonprofit. And I was basically bringing together like-minded, uh, lefty, liberal, progressive people into a space. It was a cross-cultural, cross-issue, progressive community and network. And we grew to thousands of people. We hosted hundreds of events. And what was interesting is we, we were like-minded like in a value way, but we had very different sort of what was our main cause. Mm. And bringing people in a room and thinking about, well, how do we actually find ways of commonality? How do we help people connect? And the regulars, uh, you know, I asked them out for coffee after about the first year and I sort of charged them with the idea of creating a welcoming space and they were all for the idea. But then when I said, you know, and then mingle, they were like, uh, it's deer in headlights, you know, because then I realized, wow, most of these people, there's almost 20 people here, most are shy and or introverted. And the idea of just like work in a room, mingling, is mm -hmm. just the antithesis of a good time for them. Coming early, sure, helping set up, all those things, work the door. So I started coaching them and then I, uh, I was dating someone who was a shy introvert, and she took notes while I talked for a few hours, and that became the outline that, ye what, a decade later <laughs> is essentially what I'm still doing. I now have four days of content, <laughs> but it's essentially what I'm still doing. And I was training them, and then I was like, well, I can offer this pro bono to these groups, and I started offering to a bunch of grassroots groups around town. Always in Boston? Uh, this is all in Boston. And then at some point, um, I actually got asked to speak on fundraising. It wasn't even my first paid speaking opportunity in 2009. It wasn't on networking. Someone knew that I did fundraising and knew I spoke on networking and figured I could come and do that. Mm -hmm. And I got flown down to DC to speak to a national board of directors. And I'll tell you a little trick that I did. As they came in from their break, there's about 23 of them, I think. I remembered, I memorized their names as they sat down. And when they said, oh, before we get started, we should do introductions, I said, oh, let me. And then I ran the intros and shared a little bit about each of them that I had learned. And wow. they all, they were all doctors. They all sat up. <laughs> they all like very, like very attentively. It was such a parlor trick. I mean, but you know, I, I did that. And then from that point on, I just sort of, I doubled my fee each time someone said yes to what I asked for, you know, cause first, you know, you say $400 and you know, you don't get it. And then all of a sudden one day, a year later, someone just said yes. And then I was like, well now it's, you know, $800. <laughs> and I just kept doing that. <laughs> 
an event, you know, then it's sort of now you just get a call and you're just like, well, how much is it? Am I flying there? And what are you covering? And it's a very different world to now be able to choose um, what, I, what I go to. And I was just in Tennessee for an inaugural women's leadership conference. So mm -hmm. I'm leaning more actually towards working more with these women leadership spaces. And my new book is called uh, Your Relationship-Based Business Plan, Achieve Greater Impact, Parentheses, and Income. Mm -hmm. And it really is tied into the clients that I'm working with now and the program that I have for them, which is the MORE program for entrepreneurial women, which is the six-month program that I was mentioning earlier. Yeah, yeah, I saw the alliteration of the... Yes, yeah, so MORE as, a, let's see, uh, money, opportunities, referrals, engagement. That's MORE. But what my clients need to learn about is mindset, offering value, relationships, and energy management. Mm. And so I, if they want this MORE, they have to do this more. <laughs> I love that. I love that. You're a master of that stuff. Just love, I just love you. I oh, love your energy. You, I love so much about you. So what would someone expect to work with Robbie? In other words, give me an example of somebody that you've worked with, mm -hmm. where they were when you met and where they are after working with you. Well, just to continue the story from earlier, I have this client, 18 years uh, as a career coach, uh, in her late 50s, decides she wants more, right? That's the, sort of the bottom line of this. And so she, her podcast is launching next week. So that was sort of the, we started working together over the summer in a group program. Now we've been doing a little bit of one-on-one. -on -one. She's starting again in, the, in my next cycle of my group program that starts in January. So, but now she's building out the rest of her business. The only way she was able to do this was for her to find time. Remember, she had a full calendar. So in a six-month period, starting last summer to now, she has doubled her rates, and reduced her client hours by 20%. She has doubled her rates by, she had two increases. So in a six-month period, she increased her rates twice and then has one entire day a week. It's actually two half days or one day, depending. What do you attribute that to, doubling her rates? Mindset. More than anything. She had a reason to find time in her schedule to do all this other work, and the only way she was going to make that happen is if she could have the revenue still. Mm. And I said, you know, part of it is that you're saying yes to everybody. Like, it's hard to have a podcast or write a book if you don't know who you're writing it to or who your listeners are. Mm. So I think it is, is making her kind of go through those steps. Who's her ideal client? Which makes it easier to say no to the people who are not. And she's making a referral network. So if, if someone came up and it wasn't a good fit, she could refer them to somebody else. If, if a no is the right answer, the no is gonna happen, which is giving space for other people. And she's just, it's not magic, but it's happening. She's attracting more of her ideal clients as she becomes aware of who they are. She's tuning into that. And people are showing up who really understand the value of what she can offer. And this is before the podcast launch. This is before she had the email that went out, right? This is the pre-work mm -hmm. because I can tell people the steps, but the steps won't help them if the mindset's not there. Yeah. I, I had someone tell me one time, if everyone is saying yes to you for your, for your service, then you need to raise your rates. If everybody says, okay, I'll pay that. I'll, that's good. I remember I met a guy a couple of years ago offline and he was getting $50 an hour as a coach. And everybody, everybody was saying yes. I said, well, of course everybody's saying yes. You're giving it away. Mm -hmm. So you had her double her rates. That's awesome. And you know what? This year I have found, I started out at one place, and I have now doubled and then a little more than that. And it seems like the more of an investment it is to work with you, the more value it shows and the easier it is to actually get. Do you find that? It is interesting. I piloted my online program uh, a year and a change ago. And so that was a lower fee, right? And people said yes pretty quickly. Um, but they also had to teach me things along the way because it was a pilot program. So we were learning, co-creating that. Mm -hmm. Then I ran a 90-day version, and that was a struggle. I had to do a lot of learning about what my market needed. I had to really understand, finally, who my ideal clients were and that they had already known I was their person long before I knew they were. <laughs> I needed to pay attention. Uh, and once I tuned into that, that became easier to fill. Now I'm thinking, okay, I need, I, what they need is a little more. So now I made a six-month program. Those are the first 100 days they get that clarity of what they should be working on, which they may not be what they came to me for, but they get that 90 days to finally get the, oh, okay, here's the order of things. Mm -hmm. you know, that's the relationship-based business plan is the, is the sequence of your goals so that you can create momentum, you can leverage your time. But they needed the second 90 days to actually implement, to be still in that support structure 
So the second 90 days is all masterminds, whereas the first, it's a mix of one-on-one -on -one and master classes that have content and masterminding is a small group of four people. Well, I filled the first three spots really quickly, even though the price point had jumped tremendously because the, I think I was able to articulate the value so much more clearly mm. than the second time around when I was still trying to figure it out. So I do think you know, there's a piece here about knowing your value, which is not easy to do for anyone, but I think women are socialized to underestimate their value. There's all these courses on how to you know, uh, ask for, a, a negotiate a raise or negotiate your salary to start with. And women tend not to do as much of that and they start out at a lower rate and increase at a lower rate. And so similarly, if you're a solopreneur, you have to know how to articulate your value. Get to the point where people are saying no, and then you realize, okay, now I can, I'll, I'll make some deals. I'll, 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 you know, I do an early bird. I wanted to raise my rates by quite a bit, so I ran an early bird special. If you, you know, respond by this deadline, you save a third off. Psychologically, yeah. people are like, ooh, I have to make an action. So you have to make it compelling, and you have to make it time sensitive. Yes. If you're always available for $50 an hour, I don't have to say yes now. I can also wait. I could push it off. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's been a challenge for me is, is, is getting all of those components, you know, the social proof and the urgency and uh, limited and exclusive and, and all of that. So in the last minute of our show, what would you like our viewers to know? What would you like to share with them to help mm -hmm. them really step into their greatness? Well, I actually think one of the things they can do if they, if they attend conferences, which I think is a fairly universal experience, write their follow-up email before they go to the event. Hmm. Look at that. I, even, even the equity expert hadn't heard of that one. <laughs> I love it. That's my goal. It's a fine thing get me hadn't done. So <laughs> that will put them through the paces of why this event in particular, out of all the events they could do, who they want to meet, who they want to talk to, what they want to learn, what are they offering, what's the value they're bringing to the space. They'll go in with greater clarity and greater focus, greater purpose. They'll track the business cards differently, the ones that are important, high priority versus the ones you just kind of get in those circles like a poker game. Yeah. And secondly, schedule the time to do your follow-up before you even leave. So as soon as you book to go to a conference, book within two days of the conference, an hour or so on your calendar to do the follow-up. If you've done your pre-letter, you've drafted it, you've tracked your cards, and you, you have that time, you, you're gonna make the most of that opportunity. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. It's, it's really about time management and getting it all in. It's uh, not magic, right? Well, maybe it is. The <laughs> rabbit was already there. It's about planning. <laughs> <laughs> Set intention, pay attention, create retention I like is it. what I call it. So, Robbie, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. It is a jungle, but we can be happy. CamiBaker.com, Robbie <laughs> Samuels here on the Happiness Jungle. Thank you for tuning in. The preceding program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters.